What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the After Effect Podcast. I am your host, LeBron Stephan, but you can call me B-Ron, Ron Brian, LBZ, L Boogie, LB. Welcome to episode 36. We have a very, very special guest. <clears throat> Jawad Williams is on the show today. Literally a Cleveland legend and trailblazer. Went to St. Edward High School, was American in 2001. Went to North Carolina from 2001 to 2005. Was an NCAA champion in 2005. Went to the 2005 NFL draft. Um, played with the Cavs from 2008 to 2010. And it's actually still playing right now. I think it's, this is year 15 or 16 for him playing overseas in Japan. Honored and blessed to have him on the show. So just waiting for the tap on and we will go in. What's good, man? How you been? I'm good, man. Grinding as usual. Oh, What's yeah. Hey, I, I can't call it, man. I appreciate you calling out the time. I know you're super busy. Man, I'm good. It's 11 o'clock at night, so I'm straight. I'm winding <laughs> down for the night. Oh, yeah. I already know, man. So like I was trying to tell you, um, I started this podcast about six months ago because I feel like as athletes, we all have a after effect, an aftershock of our careers. And this is kind of just a platform for us to kind of relive our journey, uh, but more so kind of try to push the culture forward kind of telling our stories as far as what we feel like we messed up on or, you know, what we feel like we experienced as far as racism or politics. Uh, I just try to, you know, push the culture forward and make sure that the next culture don't don't make the, whatever mistakes we make. Yeah, I got you. I'm with it, man. I've been following. I've been paying attention to the interviews. I like them. I like uh, it. I like oh, it. Man, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. I know, I know I'm uh, a little younger than you, and I'm, you know, I'm done playing, and you're, you're still actively playing. But I just know when I decided to hang, hang the cleats up as far as football is concerned, uh, you know, it took me a while to kind of get over my whole career. I just, I, you know, I think I was a bit too hard on myself. I felt like I underachieved and all those things. Just from seeing guys like you and Pierre Woods and LeBron James and being from Cleveland, really just wanted to put on. Um, when it was over for me, you know, it, it took me like almost a year to – kind of identify what I was passionate about outside of sports and kind of reinvent myself. But it took me a while. So I kind of wanted to just kind of share, share the light on that. Got you. I got you. I feel you. I, I've, I've heard that story before, man. That's yeah. why I'm in year 16. <laughs> yeah. I ain't trying to walk away until I know I'm ready to walk away. You know right, I mean? right, 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 right. On your, on, on your own terms. Uh, yeah. Before I dive into your childhood, man, let's just talk a couple of current events. Um, you know, I know you still actively playing, so I know I know you got your ears to the uh, you know the climate of basketball right now. I know it's early. You know, we we'll, we'll, the season doesn't start till December twenty second. But who do you think will win the NBA championship this year and why? The Lakers. I mean, they got Brown on their team. Man. You got LeBron James on your team. You automatically a contender. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah, see nobody yeah. beating them, man. And as good as they were last year, their roster got better. That's crazy. Man, I know. That's I crazy know. to think about. They got better. Like right. they're they gonna be tough, man. They're gonna be real tough to beat. It's, it's and I, I I'm so excited to get your perspective because I know, like you said, you year sixteen, Brian year eighteen, like. Is it, is, does it trip you out to see him like still do like what he does now? I think he's turned he turns thirty six in a couple of weeks, but you yeah. know I, I know you got you all got a good relationship. You all have been tight since high school. Does it trip you out to see that he's literally damn near getting better as he gets older? <laughs> I think he's getting better. I think he's getting better, man. Because as you get older and you get more experience, everything slows down for you. Right. Like you see the game two and three steps ahead. So like he was already ahead of his ahead of his time as far as his basketball IQ. Exactly. And now he's getting even more experience. So now he just taking his time and picking things apart. You can't. Man, it's, it's so he's it's, been doing yeah, what he's been doing for so long, you can't teach. And now he's gotten better at that. Like that's crazy. Yeah, he the game literally just looks easy to him. And it's crazy because I re I remember, you know, as a like a nine, ten year old going to his games, going to your games, and just to see both of you all still playing is just it's trip. It's trippy to me, honestly. <laughs> and for me, dog, like honestly, I set, I set a goal for myself early. Like mm -hmm. I told myself, no matter what happens, I'm playing till I'm forty, and I'm yeah. playing wherever the ball is bouncing. You yeah. know, like yeah. a lot of guys have a problem going overseas. I never yeah. had that issue. Yeah. Because I, I look at it like, I still make a great living. I still exactly. do what I love to do. Exactly. And I, my family get to travel the world on somebody else's dime. You can't exactly. beat that. Man, I'm, I'm telling you, and, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm big on travels as well. And like you said, I think a lot of guys just aren't, like, 
they don't open their mind up to the to the to the aspect of wanting to travel the world and see different cultures and, and understand different cultures. And so, what was that instilled that you in, uh, at a under at a younger age? Like, where did you get that kind of longing and wanting to be okay with traveling the world, taking in different cultures? Because you know, a lot of guys that come from we that come from where we from, you know, they 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 want to be in like a normal environment. They don't want to be uncomfortable in a different environment where they don't understand the culture or they don't understand the language. So, kind of kind of where, where did that come from for you? I honestly don't know, man. To be honest with you, I had this conversation with somebody recently, and I was telling them how growing up. I never left St. Clair yeah. unless I was going to school when I was going to St. Ed's. Yeah. Other than that, I didn't feel comfortable leaving St. Clair. Like, yeah. I didn't go to the Heights to party. I didn't go to Shaker <laughs> to talk to no girls. I was on St. Clair. <laughs> yeah. Like, that yeah. was my comfort zone. So right. then one time the opportunity got presented to me to go play for the USA team okay. uh, when I was in high school. It was either go to my graduation or go to, go to play in, uh, in France for the USA team. Yeah. I had never been out of the country. And I was like... I'm going. Yeah. My mother, I, I actually got, got on the plane to go to France with like two hundred dollars, dog, and man. just figured it out when I got out there. It's we ended crazy. up winning the gold and everything. And ever since then, it was like, man, I've been. I, and this is before, you know, this is way before iPhones and translation yeah, yeah. apps and all that. that that's so probably that's there. probably when it, when the internet was just. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah. this dial up was just coming about. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I figured it out. And then after that, I was like, man, if I had to do this for a living, I mean, it is what it is. I can figure yeah. it out. Oh, man, de definitely. And that's and that's such a great experience, you know, for you uh, being a young guy as well. So that's, you know, I, I, I know I know that's an experience you would never be able to, you know, forget. Yeah, man. We was out there for a week in a city called Douai in France. And then we got a couple of days in between tournament, in between the tournament or something like that. And we went out. Uh, went to Paris. That was the first time I had been to the Eiffel Tower, and this is wow. stuff you only read about in books. Now I'm telling and you, I'm out there. I'm out there living it up. We yeah. land on the ground with the disposable cameras, taking pictures of the Eiffel Tower. You know? <laughs> right, right. And I, I, man, I hope that you still got all those pictures because those, those. I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah, like, yeah. That team, like some of the notable guys on that team, Carmelo was on that team, and yeah, uh, Sheldon yeah. Williams. Okay, yeah, I yeah, I, I remember them, and uh, it's funny that you said Paris. So, do you feel like that 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 was where the idea came from for your children's book? That kind of, uh, you know, were you telling stories involving your kids from you know traveling Paris and traveling Tokyo? Is that kind of what what planted that seed for that idea? No, you know, that just came about because I actually played in Paris after okay. long after when I left the Cavs. Um, my next stop was Paris. I signed. A, I played in Paris for three years. My my daughter was born and raised in Paris. Well, okay. no, I'm sorry. She was raised in Paris, pretty much. She was born okay. in Cleveland and raised in Paris. Okay. And um, you know, just all the pictures we had, and I was like, I need to document this somehow. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And I was. I actually like. It was like a God-given talent, I guess. It's just something I realized I couldn't let go to waste. I'm good at writing my thoughts down. Okay. So I started writing things down and um, it just turned into a children's book. I was like, let me give them something that they'll always remember right. that they can share with other kids. And on right. top of that, uh, it's another source of income for them. Exactly. So they'll always be able to have this, this income coming in later when these books continue to sell way exactly. when I'm gone. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So that, that, was, that was big. Man, I, I, felt, I, I felt like that was so smart and you know st strategic so like when you when you first came out with it years ago I, I understood the whole the whole thought process i just think i i did it because i feel like you know where we come from it's not a lot of like i feel like it wasn't really cool well i can only talk about my my father my ogs my father from kinsman but i feel like we didn't grow up like that we didn't like i never saw my father writing or journaling or writing on his thoughts or really good with his words he more so just was a real tough like hard nosed dude. So uh to see to see you had the courage enough to be able to do that and you know pass that to your kids and, and start an income for them at such a young age. I was so inspired by that. Yeah, I feel you because I didn't grow up in a household where I seen people picking up books and all that other stuff, but I was always fascinated with history. So I, I fell in love with history and I started reading books. Yeah. And then I started just opening up my mind to different things, financial literacy and everything mm -hmm. else. And I was like, I can write. Let me make a book that'll mm -hmm. bring in extra income. I can pass this down to my kids. Mm -hmm. It was a whole thought process. And then when the pandemic hit, I had time on my hands. No, yeah. I, what happened first, I got hurt. I okay. tore my Achilles and uh, I had time on my hands. I was like, let me go ahead and bang these books out. Yeah. Literally, if people think these books took years for me to generate it, 
man, I probably got them done within a couple of days. Yeah. Like literally I just sit there. Then the longest process is getting it illustrated. Mm-hmm, but other mm-hmm. than that, I just sit down. It's easy when it's a true story to put it on paper. You know what yeah. I mean? So I yeah. put it in paper. I had a vision of what I want the pictures to look like. And I had yeah. actual pictures of my kids in these places. So now you just got to turn that picture into a cartoon. To, into illustration. Yeah. Oh, that's it. That's yeah. it. So we was, it was good. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's funny, man. Cause I've had an idea for years journaling the writing since like 2016, but I had an idea. Like I kind of wanted to tell a story through a cartoon tune lens of like kind of what we went through, like walking to school or like walking in the inner city. But then, but then, but you know, because I, I'm a twin, I had a twin. So I had to protect her every day. So I, I used to get in fights and all these different things would happen just trying to walk to school and walk home. But then like, kind of like, you know, give them superpowers or something like that. <laughs> but, but I just, I just never knew the action steps. So seeing you, uh, seeing you and then you, obviously you telling me you wrote, you wrote it first and you had to find an illustrator. So over the years doing the research and learning, uh, that's definitely something I want to do maybe in like two or three years. <laughs> man, you let me know. I, I'll walk you through as best I can. It's the okay. easiest thing in the world, man. You got a story, like just, it's easy. Put it yeah. on paper. Yeah. Have somebody proofread it to make sure your punctuations and you spell the things right. right and all that. Right. Then get it illustrated, man. You know what you want. And then for me, another thing I did, I also didn't tell anybody about the book. The only right. person right. that knew was my wife. Yeah. And I didn't tell her, I didn't tell anybody because, you know, you tell somebody. They take your you idea. Would never, you would, ex- <laughs> not even yeah. that. They'll uh-huh. never expect me to write a children's book. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. They're like, you're Jawah Williams from St. Clair, the basketball player. Right. What you, you doing right? Book? Right, right. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, some, certain things you can't tell people. They, they dream killers, you know what I'm, I'm saying? Oh, I'm, I'm telling like, oh, it ain't gonna work. I'm telling you. It ain't oh, gonna or, work and all that. Yeah, or, yeah or, or just the funny the funny energy, like, oh, how you think you're gonna do that? Or so, something like that. Yeah. Exactly, so I keep a lot of stuff to myself and then I drop something and people be like, you did that? I'm like, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. I... Got to keep it. I, mean, I can walk in, chew gum. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> All at the same time. So last, last current event, man. And I know you just talked about the pandemic. How how have you grown? Obviously, since we've been on the earth, the world has never ever shut down. We've never walked through anything like this. So how have you grown spiritually, emotionally, physically? You know, first obviously as a husband and a father, but then more so than anything as a black man. As we walk through this coronavirus, as as we walk through all these racial injustices, finally starting to come out. Obviously, we're black. We're from the inner city of Cleveland. So we've been dealing with these kind of things our whole life. We had to kind of figure out how to navigate through it. But now it's finally starting to make sense to the world. So what's your take on that? How have you grown during these nine months? Uh, For me, I just, I just, I realized that I know, like you said, I know this is nothing new. Exactly. Like, And a lot of people, in my opinion, they play dumb. Like, mm-hmm. you know, this is not too new, too, but exactly. now it's the age of the cell phones and cell phone cameras. Social media. So a lot of things are getting caught. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we knew about this stuff already. You know, mm-hmm. the police, the way they act in our neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. We knew this. Like, growing up, we used to run from the police all the time on St. Clair. All we weren't time. running because of what we did. We ran because of what they would say we did. And mm-hmm. we couldn't prove it. It was always mm-hmm. their word against ours, and they would win. Mm-hmm. So like, this is nothing new, you know. And then as far as the pandemic goes, I mean... It's been a, a, a blessing in certain ways because it yeah. slowed life down and made you realize what's most important. Yeah. Um, I actually, I mean, I spent plenty of time with my kids. Like my mm-hmm. twins, they're one now. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were born in January uh, 2019. So I got time to be home with them for their birthday and, yeah, all that. you know, just hang out with them. Like I've been yeah. heavy in the house, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And changed my whole workout regimen i'm getting up at 4 45 in the morning getting everything mm-hmm. done mm-hmm. you know 2020 has been it's been weird man it's been a yeah, weird year it's and, been the weirdest year ever to me <laughs> yeah and then you know i'm still traveling you know i'm in japan right now and yeah. to see how things are are different now even in japan like wearing a mask has always been normal here so mm-hmm. that's why the pen the, the the virus doesn't seem as prevalent here in japan because okay. wearing a virus and uh, I mean, wearing a mask and keeping your hands clean with alcohol pumps and all that stuff, that's been in place forever here in okay. Japan. So okay. a lot of stuff has been contained here, and it's just different times. Like, you know, the, the process I had to go through to be able to fly out of the country was mm. ahead of Oh, oh I know it was, yeah, yeah. So let me, let, let me ask you this before we dive into childhood. Um, waking up, as, a, as obviously, as a husband and a father of four, um, and I know your oldest uh, is getting older. What is she, what is she like, eight or nine or ten yeah. now? Okay, 10, 10. 10, yeah. Do you ever 
do you ever just as a black man do you ever feel pressure you know like because obviously just all these things going on do you ever feel pressure like okay let me make sure i i tell my kids everything and i know they're still young and you have to kind of shield some things from them until they get older as far as being as far and as far as like how we how we we were saw from you know different races has there ever because i i don't have any kids yet but i'm not i i got to be honest on this platform like i'm i'm scared man i'm 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 scared because it's like you just never know what what would happen right because us being black and us, uh, you know, not being able to control the narrative as far as how we're saw. So have you ever woke up with fear or are you just kind of trying to just try to be optimistic every day and try to give them as much game as you can and tell them and show them, you know, how to move on, on in, in this world? I think the biggest thing is we can't, uh, we can't think our kids don't know what's going on. Our yeah. kids, like my daughter, she's 10, but she knows the world. She's yeah. come to me with questions. I'm like, who told you that? Like, why do you know that already? Yeah. And she's like, I know. Like, she comes to me and tells me, like, um, we had a discussion when she was eight years old. She's like, Dad, most of my friends in school are black. I'm like, all right, cool. She said, they look like me. I was like, all right, cool. Why? Why? She was like, because I don't like, she got her dates mixed up. She's like, I don't, I don't like the way they used to treat uh, black and brown people in the 80s. You know what I mean? Her dates are mixed up. But mm -hmm. I didn't have to teach her this. She knows wow. these things. Wow. Like she's in a school, she's in a school where there's a lot of, there's a melting pot in her school. So she yeah. has Indian kids, Mexican kids, white okay. kids, black kids. Very diverse. But she understands it. Yeah. So kids yeah. don't, it's not like something you can hide from them. They know, they yeah. know what's going on. She talks yeah. to me about politics. It's like, I'm not talking to a 10 year old sometimes when I'm talking to my daughter. Yeah. And my son, uh, my oldest son, he's six. And sometimes I have to trying to I have to give him the blunt truth a little earlier because he's a right. black he's gonna yeah. be a black man in this yeah. world. Yeah. So I have to give him the early truth. Like look, you can't do what some of these other kids are doing. Right. And even though he's six, he looks like he's ten. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. yeah. He, he's going he's gonna go through the same thing I went through. You know, when mm -hmm. I was thirteen, people thinking I'm 18, 16, 19 17. years old. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right, right. So you gotta like you're gonna have to move a little bit different. You know what I mean? You gonna have to yeah. be real strategic about what you do, who you mm -hmm. hang out with. Always. And, um, but it's never a thing of moving in fear. It's just education and, and making sure that I lay the groundwork and lay mm -hmm. the foundation for them to have a better life. Right, right, right. And, and, and like you said, I can attest to that. The foundation, the foundation is huge because I feel like I have really young parents. My parents had me really young, but they, they were very, very hard on me. Like you said, they laid that foundation. So I kind of knew even growing up in the inner city, even have to, having to walk to school and go through different battles and fights and all those things i knew how to read people i knew who to hang out with i knew you know i, I knew i kind of knew how to navigate through that inner city culture and not and and you know to not get stuck in it if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i feel you i mean we, we walked that path you know yeah. what I, mean? I had to <laughs> we grew up on we had a house on eddie road and we had another house on 143rd in st Clair. Mm -hmm. so you know i had to navigate from sometimes getting from 143rd in st Clair to 113th in St. Clair to go to Glenville Ray. Yeah. You know, you walk into two, three different hoods at that point. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and not everybody, not everybody knows me as like the kid that's going to grow up to play basketball. So exactly, you kind of got to move exactly. a little different. Exactly. You I used to take the back route, you know, yeah. going through the factories on my bike. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So I can yeah. avoid the dudes yeah. on 125th that didn't know me. You know what exactly. I mean? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, that, and, and, and that's the thing about growing up in inner city, you just never know. Growing up in that environment, you never know when you would get chose or when you would get tried. It's, and, and to me, like I said earlier, I was a twin, so it was it was always nothing could happen to my sister. So I was always on guard and no tilt and kind of like real frigid because I knew if anything happened to her, like it, you know, I it, it would be me. Like my parents would be looking at me. So I, you know, it's it's crazy just navigating through that. But I, I'm glad I did, man. So let, let's let's talk about your childhood. I know you was born in '83. I was born in '89. Talk about the Cleveland culture in the late 80s, early 90s. Did you have any influences or mentors growing up? Just try to walk me through your childhood a little bit. Man, I think growing up, besides my parents, who I looked up to, my older sister, Nashima Hillman, Nashima Anderson, now she married. Um, those were the people I looked up to. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I had some people I seen from a distance. Uh, growing up, of course, you had the dope boys. It's kind of like who we idolized growing up. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? That's who mm -hmm. we seen with the flashy cars. Yep, cars, money. Yep. I wanted a part of that. I wanted to be a part of that at one point. But, um, you know, hats off to some of the dope boys that I grew up with. They 
push me in another direction. Like, mm-hmm. nah, you too, mm-hmm. they used to tell me, like, you too tall to be out here with us. You're going to get us all caught. <laughs> so they literally would push me in another direction. But, yeah. like, I think one of the a defining moments for me was uh, Mike Tyson. Mm-hmm. I remember playing, we was playing in the driveway on Eddie Road, and I seen a white car with a gold emblem. I had never seen this before. Like, my dream car was a, a Riviera growing up, a, yeah. a Aurora and all that. Yeah, because that's what we saw. Yeah, and I, yeah. they get closer, and there's this dude in there with a big head. I'm like, hmm. And I realized it's Mike Tyson. Wow. And that day right there kind of changed my life. He, like, he rode by, looked at us, and just kept driving, because he used to spend a lot of time in Cleveland with Don King. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. And I was a kid, seeing him in the driveway right there kind of triggered something, and it was yeah, like, I can only whatever imagine. car that is, I want that. You know yeah. what I mean? Then it kind of just snowball effect. I just started going after everything and yeah. set my sights high and watching all the Jordan games on WGN Channel 9. All yeah, that. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Same here, man. That, that That's a crazy experience to, to see to see Mike Tyson in, in the same neighborhood that you grew up in. I, like you said, I know that put that brother in your back. So what, let me ask you this, what middle school did you go to? Like what prompted you to go to St. Ed um, and because I know you, like you said, you grew up in the Glenville community and I know, and I'm sure everybody wanted you to go to Glenville high school and, you know, because you grew up around there and you grew up in the, in the Glenville wreck. So what made you go? And I know you got your sister played at Trinity and then Vanderbilt. So I'm sure that probably has something to do with it. She went to a Catholic school. So what went into your decision or your parent, you are, your parents always wanted you to go to St. Ed. They wanted me to go. They wanted me outside the neighborhood. Yeah. Like yeah. my mother knew. She, my mother and father, they kind of knew, but they didn't know what I was into. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? The best way for them to control, not not control me, but the best way for them to make sure I stayed on the right path was to send me away. Yeah. And I, I was, it was either Benedictine or St. Ed's, and I go to St. Ed's and I ran into Steve Logan. You know, he's from 105 in St. Clair, so we yep. from the same neighborhood. Yeah. I'm like, well, he over here, I'm gonna go ahead and go over here too. But um, going to St. Ed's, kind of changed my life for the better because it mm-hmm. took me out of the, the mix of having to be um I want don't get me wrong I wanted to go to Glenville hands mm-hmm. down I told my mother I can't do this all boy stuff yeah I need to go to Glenville like I don't care what happened with guys before me because you know a lot of guys didn't really make it out of Glenville I was like mm-hmm. I'm gonna be different yeah like she's like no just go ahead get on that bus take that hour and a half bus ride yeah take that long bus ride yeah the hour and a half sometime it was I take 326 from 125th all the way to West 140th. Man, and I, Nine, and 90 like minutes that, on the bus. Yeah. yeah, man. And I, I'm on a bus with the kids going to public school. Yeah. So like, you know what I'm saying? They, I'm, I'm into my uniform and they looking yeah. at me crazy. I'm like, man. Did you, did you, is. did you catch any flack just like, just like in the neighborhood for 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 initially going there? Did people always say little smart little remarks or comments to you, or people kind of accepted it? No, nah, everybody accepted it. They knew what I was on. Yeah. I think yeah. I think a lot of guys knew what I was on. Like, you know, Rich grew up in our neighborhood too, Rich Paul. Yeah. So yeah. his dad used to own R and J's a store at 125th where I used to catch the bus and get okay. off the bus. Okay. So when I used to get off the bus, all the dope boys would be standing out there and they see me with my uniform and you know, little jacket and all that. Yeah. Not one smart remark was ever made. They knew what I was on. Yeah. You know what I mean, they used to be yeah. like, yo, you gotta keep going, Shorty. Like you could do it. Yeah, that respect you could was do there. It. They used to, yeah, they used to, you know, a couple extra dollars, give me five dollars so I can have the money for lunch, you know, little stuff like that. Yeah, I had dudes like that, that were really looking out for me. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 powerful. That's powerful, and that's and that's good that it was like that for you. So talk about once you got to St. Ed's and really just kind of coming into your own, continuing to grow. You started to get a bunch of like, uh, you know, mail and recruitment from all these big colleges. Just talk about. You know, when you really started to come into your own and really start to feel like, you know, you know that, you know that feeling. I didn't get it until 10th grade when you just had that growth spurt and you started getting that, that, that mail and the coaches started to come to see you and you really started mm-hmm. to feel like you're coming into your own and your dreams starting to become kind of a reality. Like, okay, maybe I probably, maybe I can't really go to Division One, you know, on a football or basketball scholarship. Just talk about that a little bit. Well, when I first got the ads, it was a, a culture shock for me. You know, I'm coming mm-hmm. from the hood where everybody lives around me is black. I get yeah. the same as everybody's white. We got four black people in my whole class, like the whole yeah. freshman class. Yeah. And that right there, you know, I ran into some racism and all mm-hmm. that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I put hands on people for their racism and all that. Yeah. But yeah. Um, over time, I got cool. And like, I realized like some of these dudes really don't understand where I come from. So I got mm-hmm. real cool with some of the white guys who were on the wrestling team. 
Okay. And they used to be like, yo, why I'm going to take you home today? And they used to take me home literally just to see how it was in the neighborhood. Yeah. I used yeah. to take them to open pit. We used to go to open pit and stuff after school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Some of them still go down to open pit to this day. Yeah. They're like, man, I go down there and get a Polish boy, you know, it's <laughs> yeah, just something yeah. new. Yeah. But like, I think everything, that switch hit probably my sophomore year. Mm -hmm. Um. I go to ABCD camp, Adidas mm -hmm. All-American camp. I get invited. I go up there and have a, have a great showing. Um, it's weird for me because I was more respected around the nation than I was in my own city. Wow. Like, plain dealer and all that stuff. Yeah. Didn't show me no love. Zero. That's crazy. I wasn't even, I wasn't even one of the best in our area, according to them. Yeah. But I was top 20 in the nation as a sophomore. Like, that don't even make sense, but... Yeah. That's how it's always been, you know, throughout my career. Like, you know, yeah. I guess I was, you know, how you're too close to somebody, so you don't see it. Yeah. Apparently, yeah, yeah. you didn't see it. And that's what it was. So I just never, I never really cared about uh, Cleveland media or Cleveland hype. Yeah. Just and then the local. a lot of guys. Yeah. I would, yeah. a lot of guys were local stars. That's what I used to mm -hmm. call them. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, he's a local star. Like, and I used to tell people, like, yo, he's, he's not that good. He's good to y'all. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? But, and I couldn't prove it. I just, I just did my own thing, man. That's why yeah. you, nobody ever seen me uh, with a big click or anything like that. I kind of just yeah. stayed under the radar and did my own thing. Yeah. And it's crazy because, like I said, back in, like, 2000, 2001, I used to go to your games all the time. My dad used to always take me to either you or the Bronze Age games. And I was super young, but it was just putting a battery in my back because I played football and basketball. But it's crazy that the playing dealer wouldn't show you any love because you was, you was clearly – clearly one of the best out there like and i was only maybe like i can't maybe like 10 or 11 and i and i knew that you know dunking guys dunking on guys running the floor just doing super tangible could shoot you know shoot threes and shoot got had me range game uh post moves was kind of more advanced than most guys really had in high school really to be honest so it's like so and, if you go back if you go back and look at them old press clippings of best yeah. of the best remember they used to do that in the plain dealer yeah yeah i used to be honorable mention i didn't make it probably until my senior year and at this point i wanted the top recruits in the nation but my mm -hmm. own like i said locally nobody really gave me the respect i deserve but that's wild. it didn't McDonald's stop McDonald's all american like, that's wild <laughs> yeah i didn't get zero respect Zero, but like I said, it was cool because it was they was pumping up local stars. I was I was on something bigger, and I always yeah. knew that. Of course, of course. So, what what went into your recruitment process? Who were your like top three, and then what kind of catapulted your decision? You know, obviously after you were at McDonald's All America, what what prompted your decision to go to UNT? Now I know, I'm sure it was a dream of yours, right? Because because the best of the the best in the world went there, and Michael Jordan. So was that a, was North Carolina always a dream of yours, or like kind of what what went through your decision? Uh, I, man, my, my initial, I really wanted to go, first of all, my, my final five came down to UNC, Duke, uh, Cincinnati, uh, USC, and Florida. Okay. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think I added another, oh, and Maryland was in there too. But um, I wanted to go to Cincinnati. I would have committed to Cincinnati after my oh, freshman yeah. year of high school. Oh, yeah, because your boy went there. Steve Logan went there. Steve Logan was there already. Yeah, and then yeah. Coach Huggins, I had, you know, kept running into him at different events. And he told me, he's like, hey, I need – DeMar Johnson was uh, getting ready to um, vote for the NBA. Mm -hmm. He said, hey, DeMar's leaving. The job is yours. I just need you to come shoot some threes for me, and then you go ahead and leave too. So I was like, sign me up. I'm going yeah. to Cincinnati. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My mother was like, my mother was like no, nah, they got a 0% graduation rate. Oh, like, Here we go. Wow. So then – did, she, did, she, did, she didn't let – she did the middle path with you, didn't let you kind of explain to her any – any kind we of did. argument to, to, to swear? I tried to explain okay. to her like how, to, how it works. Like JUCOs don't count towards the uh, – because they had a lot of uh, JUCO transfers. JUCO transfers, yeah. And it didn't count towards the graduation rate. And then she was like, no, nah, I don't think it's the right place for you. You're still kind of close. Yeah, still kind of close. she wanted to be close. Yeah. Yeah, and I was like, that's the only place I would go within Ohio. Like mm -hmm. Ohio State was completely out of the picture. I wasn't dealing with them at all. Yeah. Um, so then I committed to – I go on an unofficial visit to Maryland, and I commit. They caught mm -hmm. me at the perfect time. You know, I'm coming from St. A. It's an all-boys school, predominantly white. Yeah. And when I go on my unofficial visit to Maryland, it's um, it's like Greek week. <laughs> that That's when so, Maryland was real good. And that's when they was like top five, right? Ron I remember Dixon that. and all those dudes. Yeah, they had a squad. And it's, it's Greek week when I get there. So I'm out walking through the yard, and I see 
you know, the Deltas. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. All the like, five man, black I'm women. Here. Yeah, I'm like, I'm coming here. It's a done deal. Like, it's yeah. a wrap. I'm coming here. They took me out in D.C. and we go to one of the go-go clubs. We're like, oh, it's a done. It's done. I'm coming here. <laughs> but then I started setting my, setting my recruiting visits and I go on my official to Carolina. They send me the letter with the address that I need to be picked up at and all this stuff. And the address looked funny. I'm like, this ain't the airport. This ain't uh, Hopkins International. Yeah. And I drove right down the street to Burke Lakefront Airport. Uh-huh. You know where they do the air show. Yeah. Private jet was waiting on me. Private jet, North like, Carolina. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be a little change. So I take the private jet um, to Chapel Hill. Had a great time. Uh, met everybody, and I, you know, I go to a football game. It was a night game. Julius Peppers and those guys are playing at the time. Ron Curry. Oh man, they had. And they had I'm walking. I'm, we walk into our seats, and the whole crowd. It's like sixty thousand people, and they just chanting my name. Wow. And I was like, yeah, this this is it. I'm like, and, and that's where Ron Curry and Julius Peppers played basketball too. Yeah, they were on the basketball team at that time too, and I was like, oh, this is it. Yeah. I called home the next day. I didn't tell the coaching staff. I called home. I said, yeah, I'm coming to Carolina. My mother was like, you sure? I was like, I'm positive. She said, what about Maryland? I was like, what about them? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming to Carolina. That, and it was that, that Navy, yeah, that Navy blue, man. I'm sure you saw, you saw that. And like you said, the private jet. And, and back then, that wasn't really happening. What was that, like 2000? Yeah. That was 2001. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the private jets really weren't happening. That's, I'm sure that was a crazy experience. Yeah, I still keep in touch with the pilot, man, Mr. Billy. That's my guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So talk about, man, your transition going from, you know, obviously McDonald's All-American at St. Ned's and then, you know, going into like a a wildly known legendary university like North Carolina. Kind of walk, walk me through that, that transition. And I'm sure it was probably a little bit easier because you had already had that culture shock from going from the inner city from you know K to eighth, and then going to St. Ned, and getting used mm-hmm. to kind of that that predominantly predominantly white culture. So talk about your transition from St. Ned to North Carolina. Uh, off the court transition was pretty smooth, man. If anything, mm-hmm. it was it was easy. It was an easy transition because you're around the other basketball players, and we all mm-hmm. coming from different places. Mm-hmm. Some of them coming from that same hood background, so we were able to latch on to each other. Like my yeah. roommate was Melvin Scott, he from Baltimore. Jackie Manuel was my other guy, he's from West Palm Beach. Mm-hmm. So we were together every day, 24 seven, you know what I mean? So we, we leaned on each other a lot. Mm-hmm. The The biggest transition was probably on the court. Like I'm used to being a man. Yeah. You get to yeah. Carolina, it don't work like that. Like yeah. everybody's a man. Everybody's right a man, right. So we had to figure out how to play together. And then my first year, we go eight and twenty, and Maryland wins the national championship. Oh, uh, so, I know you was like, oh, did I make the right man, decision? So, like, yeah, exactly. I'm like, I knew I shouldn't have came here, and I'm backtracking, <laughs> but I'm like, man, I ain't never been one to run from nothing. Right, right. So we had to stand, we stuck it out, and then we built the uh, we built the team back up to where it was supposed to be, and got mm-hmm. the program back on the right, right, the right track. Yeah. So when when did when did you feel like? Like you said, you all turned that title wave, obviously going eight and twenty your freshman year, and then and then did you feel like y'all turned it around your sophomore year or was it or was it more so not to your junior year when you when you all really started to have those winning seasons? It was probably my junior year. Uh my junior year and my sophomore year, we had an identical record, nineteen and sixteen. Mm-hmm. But the difference was Roy Williams came from Kansas yeah. uh, my junior year and um he kind of like he forced us to play together. Like mm-hmm. we, it wasn't like we didn't like each other. We just were that talented. Like yeah, we would just let all one that guy talent go. on the court. Yeah, yeah, it was hard yeah, to balance like, all that talent. Yeah, but then he he put a game plan together where it was pretty much a just he did a lot of motion offense where everybody mm-hmm. got involved. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, you know, with the all we already had a, a system in place with with the um, second Carolina <laughs> secondary break. Mm-hmm. which those plays are still being run to this day. Nothing's changed, you know, but those little wrinkles in the in the offense to help everybody get involved really helped us a lot. And, um, you know, it absolutely led to our national championship and it led to so many guys from our team playing in the NBA. Yeah, yeah. And I, I remember that 2005 national championship run. So just, just talk about that year a little bit. I know you averaged, I think, 14 points the whole season. Obviously a senior starter. And then you averaged closer to 15 points in the final four. Just walk me through that season. What moments stood out to you leading up to the national championship? And also, 
kind of give me an inside look on the kind of coach that that Roy Williams is, right? Because basketball is such a smaller realm sport than football, right? You got on, on the NFL team, you got 53 guys on the college football team, you got closer to 100. But basketball, you literally only have 12 guys. So it's not too many guys who've had the opportunity to be coached by Roy Williams. So just give me an inside look on the kind of coach he was, the kind of man he was, and then whatever to you during that. Five. So like going through that year, we lost four games. And the thing that separated us from everybody else is like when we lost those four games, we don't feel like anybody ever beat us. Mm -hmm. It was like either we ran out of time or we didn't do what we were supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. never like, oh, they came in here and smacked us. That never happened. Yeah. And so when that when we going on that type of path, we like, oh, man, when we get to the tournament, we're going to run through people. Yeah. Because like, now we, we click in. Like we know yeah. what we know what we're supposed to do. We know where everybody is supposed to be. And, and Coach Williams, he kind of listened to what we wanted off the court, which helped us a lot. Mm -hmm. So this is weird. This is crazy. But like I said, some of us are coming from like a hood type background. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So at Carolina, they give you the best of the best. So we're eating mm -hmm. at Morton's. We're eating at Roots Chris and stuff like that. These filet mignons and all that. Yeah. And some of the guys are like, I'm tired of eating this. Now, yeah. You got to remember, you from the hood. They like, <laughs> like, how could you ever get tired of eating that? <laughs> exactly. But we go to like, because we was like, all right, well, what do you guys want to eat? Man, just take us to a sports bar. During the Final Four, dog, we in a sports bar eating like wings and nachos. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's what we did. That's yeah. It made everybody feel comfortable. Yeah. Like, he yeah. never really tried to control who we were off the court. You know, we still did what we needed to do when we came to, when we came to practice and we knew how to be presentable in public. Mm -hmm. But off the court, I think that helped us the most, like just letting us be who we were, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And especially back then, you, like you just kind of never knew if that was actually happening because a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, white coaches on that bigger level in the Big Ten and ACC and SEC, they kind of try to control who you are uh, off the court. And, and I mean, off the court or off the field. And I experienced that at the University of Iowa. But uh, that's dope that he let you all be you all. And that, that was a com – that combined with – obviously you all's relationships that that's yeah he didn't want to like it that was the that was the one good thing about carolina man it was just like when we go to games yeah you put on your suit and all that stuff but when you go into class and all that i mean do what you want to do like yeah. we were still going to jerk we had the big hats on with the throwbacks and all that stuff that uh -huh. was normal <laughs> everyday wear for us yeah you can't change that you know what i mean yeah, yeah. like as long as we come and show up and do our job and go to class and all that type of stuff right he had nothing to say to us that's that that's dope man so when you when you won the ncaa championship uh, you know your senior year was that kind of like a i told y'all moment like you know what i mean because obviously any of your career like coming in carolina as an american then any of your career carolina as a as a and as a senior starter did you did you have that or was it kind of like a jovial feeling like just happy to be you know a champion man it took years for it to actually sink in yeah because everything was still moving so fast like yeah. It took me probably almost a few years before I actually went back and watched the game to see what was really going on. Yeah. Like it was so many people like you you're so focused on the moment and the mm -hmm. game that mm -hmm. you don't even notice the crowd. Like mm -hmm. I didn't notice the crowd. I didn't know Lil Wayne was there. I didn't know Beyonce was there. I didn't know all this stuff until you go back and watch like yo they he were was, there. That's he was, crazy. He was he was locked in. <laughs> yeah, like you don't know all this stuff. That stuff is completely you just oblivious to all that stuff. Right, right. And then, like, moving forward, it wasn't like, I told you so, but it was like, you know, I waited for this moment. Like, I'm mm -hmm. going to seize this moment. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, like, I I get chills, like, because I, I found the intro, like, recently. Okay. Probably, like, l during the pandemic, I think I found the, the, the intro, and they are like, 694 from Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. Like, I got goosebumps looking yeah, at that, because yeah, yeah. I remember... Like, that was always my thing. Like, I wanted everybody to know I was from Cleveland, Ohio. Like, right, right. don't make a mistake and say Lakewood, St. Network. No, I'm from right. Cleveland, Ohio. I went to Lakewood, St. Network. Exactly. So that was a big thing for me. And I just remember, like, coming home and dudes in the hood, like, man, you gave people in the hood a reason to smile. Like, I'm that meant a lot to me. Exactly. That meant yeah. a lot to me, man. Yeah. Yeah, and I was, uh, I didn't graduate high school until 2007. But, yeah, just seeing your... Seeing that trajectory, obviously from the outside looking in, because we didn't meet till uh, like 2007 or something like that. But going from going to your games at St. Ed <laughs> when I was like 10 to seeing you matriculate and to do your thing in North Carolina and then to see you win the championship. And I'm older now. I'm probably like 
15, 16, and I'm becoming a uh, a top recruit on the football side. And to see you win, I was like, like you said, like you're just so happy to see that, especially and guys from Cleveland as well, because Cleveland is not when you go to different cities like Atlanta and Miami and and uh, LA. Cleveland is not that big. Like Cleveland is kind of small when you compare it to other cities. So to see guys yeah, from Cleveland right. doing it, like it's like. Yeah, it put a bat in your back to be to you know you want to do big things as well. And it was weird because when I came back like from college and I would come back to the neighborhood, people didn't know like they knew me from what they seen on TV, but they didn't understand like, oh, you still live on Eddie Road, like, yeah, like yeah. Oh, you still walking through the hood, like walking your dog through the hood. It just yeah. never registered to people. Like, you know, there was a couple times where I'm walking down the street car pull over and dudes jump out the car. I'm like, here we go. It's about to be something. Oh, they man. like, yo, you the dude from TV. I'm like, yeah, I live around the corner. Like, what you mean? Like, they don't <laughs> put two and two together. Yeah. So then that meant a lot, though, because, you know, like I said, a lot of guys told me they, I gave them a reason to smile. I'd be in open pit and people <laughs> staring at me and they like, I'm like, yeah, that, yeah. that was me. You know what yeah. I'm saying? <laughs> and it's crazy because, like you said, a lot of people didn't know that you was coming back. And I, I'm not going to hold you. I can't lie. I was surprised, like when you. I think that was about 2006. You came. We was uh having open gym, like all the basketball players. Uh, I think this was like during the spring. So I would like do football training right after school, and then after that, I would go to open gym because I played football and basketball. And then when you came out to open gym with us, that's when we met. And I ended up being on your team. We we ran like ten straight. We was beating everybody. But I just remember I was. It was like a. It was like a star moment for me because I remember seeing you at, at such a young age. And I just didn't know, like you said, that you were still in the back. And you literally ran over gym with us. Like, like uh, uh, man, you know, it's crazy because, like, people, like, older people, some people hated that I came back to the wreck all the time. That's crazy. Like, that was what I did. That was that was what I knew. Like, I didn't have any, you know, celebrity friends or NBA friends that I hung out with. Like, this is yeah. what I knew. I used to come down there. Play pickup with show with E. Yeah, yeah. They, it was all of us. That's what we did. That's what we did. Yeah. That's all playing. Yep. JM, all of them. They used to call me. Why are we hooping today? And I would show up. Like people, I don't know why people would be so shocked. I'm like, yo, these are the dudes I grew up with. Yeah. These are the guys I'm most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And it wasn't. I wasn't going nowhere else to hoop. So I was yeah, like, exactly. I was gonna go. You know where I was. This is where I learned. You yeah, know what I mean? yeah. So I, I also knew that me coming back meant a lot to the kids in the neighborhood. You man, know I'm I mean? telling you, I, like we, all, all the kids that played that day, that day in, the, in that open gym, it was it was a bunch of us. Like, of course, of course I kept it together. So like we hooping, so I'm a competitor. So, you know, I'm hooping, but in my head, I'm, I'm going crazy in my head. Like, man, I'm, man, I'm hooping with, I'm hooping with Jawad. Like, well, we playing this age, I couldn't wait to get home and tell my dad, like, yo, I was on Jawad too. We talked about it for like two hours that night. Like, man, I was balling. He gave me some compliments, man. I told you I was nice. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, like you don't you like what it's it's like it's like what you said. That really I'm man, I'm 30, I'm almost 32. And I still remember that day like it was yesterday. I still remember that day that you came in and I was on your team and all that. And a lot of a lot of guys my age who whoever was a part of that open gym, they still remember that kind of stuff, man. So that's why oh, yeah, it's so that, see that mean a lot to me because you know that was my whole goal. Like even when I made the Cavs team. Yeah. And I used to come down there like, after practice with the Cavs. I used to come down to the wreck and play shooting games with the kids all the time. Yeah. And like guys just be like, yo, why are you down here? Like, it's not safe. I'm like, what you mean it's not safe? Like the Cavs security is like, hey, we, do we need to send somebody down there with you? Yeah. I'm like, man, what I look like walking into my own neighborhood with security. Like, I'm not doing that. Like, right. I'm going down there and if anything, with, everybody with good in the is going to protect me. Yeah, yeah. they're yeah. going to protect me. You know what I'm saying? I'm the I'm the guy. Like, you're not going to – nobody's going to do anything to me. I'm good. Yeah. So I would come yeah. down there with JM, play shooting games with the kids all day, and be mm -hmm. down there for two hours. Once mm -hmm. again, I didn't have, like, the close NBA friends. Yeah. You know, this is what I knew. This is what I was most comfortable with. So yeah. I would go back to my, my roots and just be chilling. Yeah, man, and, and like you said, that was always a goal of yours, and I, and I think you reached that, man, because so many guys, man, you know, that I'm still cool with, that's closer to my age, we, that played football and basketball, that was a part of that, that those open gyms, we, everybody still remember that, Every everybody still remember that day, like, it was, it was, it was, it was a great day, man, and like you yeah, said. My nephew, my nephew was around, too, so I used to come down there and watch him play. Yeah. So then I met his friends, so that's yeah. when I started you know, Frank Clark and those guys. You know yep, what I mean? They yep, were Frank way Clark. younger than me. 
Yeah. But I used to come around, so I knew them when they were young kids. And it's Chris Worley. I remember these guys and how they growing up. Yeah. And I'm seeing them like on the big stage. And that that, that means a lot to me. Like, y'all remember right. that little kid? Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, that was a little <laughs> bad kid from the wreck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, that, and that's, and like you said, man, the, those are the memories. And those are the times that you can't really get back, you know, seeing someone like you actually make it and then coming back. That always puts a battery in in every kid's back to really try to be the, their best self and really try to achieve and do, you know, whatever, you know, whatever they set their mind to. Yeah, That's dope, man, because I, I always pray that it would be bigger than me. So Exactly, exactly. I'm glad it worked out. Definitely, man. So talk about, man, the 2005 NFL draft. You coming, I mean, not NFL, NBA draft. You coming off as, as, a, as a champion, as a world NCAA champion. I read an article where the every one in our lineup like got drafted. So like walk walk me through walk me through that process. Uh and then what 2005 NBA draft? Was it a good day? Was it a bad day? Did you get down at all seeing all your guys get drafted? And then you know. Who, what kind of teams were you hearing from? Just walk me through that a little bit. Man, so I had a small gathering. I drove up from North Carolina because I, I moved to North Carolina. I drove up from North Carolina to Cleveland mm -hmm. and uh, got a hotel room. I had a small gathering, just my family. And um, I'm superstitious. I've been carrying this Bible since, I, since 2005. I've been carrying the same Bible. It was mm -hmm. when I got reborn and everything, whatever. And... I get all the way to the hotel in Cleveland. I'm going through my bag. I can't find my Bible. So I was like, all right, that ain't a good sign. Yeah. Whatever. Like, I'm trying to push that aside. Like, all right, everything cool. Yeah. The draft starts. Now, I'm, I heard late I heard late first, early second tops. That's where mm -hmm. I'm going. Mm -hmm. So we get through the first round. I'm like, I ain't hear my name called. All right. So we get to the 35th pick. And I remember I dozed off. My mother like, wake up. They're going to call your name. And I was like, something ain't right. And yeah. then the draft kept going. Then you know the best available comes across the bottom of the screen. Mm -hmm. My name is on there, and I still don't hear my name. Yeah. Draft ends, and I was like, a shock. Like I ain't hear my name called. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. and then Jay Billis gets on TV, and I remember him saying, like, you know, it's shocking to not hear Jawad Williams' name called. And right. I'm sitting there with my close friend. I remember my nephew, my nephew Zai, he crying crazy, like. He just don't understand it. He crying. Like, my my then girlfriend, who's now my wife, she's upset. Yeah. You know, my parents probably a little upset. Mm -hmm. And I never batted an eye. They was like, you're not mad about this? I was like, for what? I was like, yeah. I've been proving people wrong my whole life. I'll do it again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. they was like, I couldn't be mad. Like, I, I didn't have time to be mad. Yeah. The next day, back in the gym. I came down to the wreck and got some work in. Mm -hmm. And then went back to Carolina continued to work. And then I got an invite to come to a uh, summer league with Golden State. I get there, then I started to learn the politics of the NBA. Okay. You know, they got their draft picks already. Monte Ellis was the point guard. Okay. They got some two foreigners on their team. So these guys is running the show. I'm barely playing. I finally mm -hmm. get to play, score 18. I'm like, all right, we good. I'm gonna get a contract. Nothing. Then I go to vet camp in San Antonio. Um, one of the last cut in San Antonio, you know, I'm, I'm having a decent camp playing with Tim Duncan and Tony Parker and these guys. Yeah. And then they was like, maybe you should go overseas. And I was like, you know what, maybe you're right. Cause I was, I was mad. So I was yeah. like, I'm gone. Yeah. So I went to Spain and then I went to Spain. Then came back, playing the, then I came back, signed another training camp deal with the Clippers. Okay. Have an unbelievable preseason. Preseason, yeah. Cooking in preseason. I'm like, oh, I'm good. I got a deal coming. Yeah. Nope. They cut me. Politics. I was the it was uh the deadline was three o'clock for for the for the final roster to be made. They laying out the jerseys to go take the media pictures. My jersey gets laid out because I just got done getting treatment. I said, "Oh, I'm good." Oh, they made it team. Two thirty, two thirty. They man. came and got me and released me. Oh. And then I'm telling guys like Sam Cassell was on the team, Elton Brand. Yeah, I remember Corey that Clippers McGay. team. Yeah, and I'm telling these dudes like, "Yo, I just got released. I'm gonna holler at y'all later." And they don't believe me. Like, they think it's a joke. I'm like, no, for real. I just got released. I'm about to go. So then they were like, the Clippers are like, go down to our G League team, our D League team at the time, and we're going to call you back up. Yeah. All right, cool. I go down there. Cool. Oh, I'm yeah, like, yeah. I saw you on, like, D League, D -League player of the year or something that year. Yeah, yeah I, I was cooking. Like, I went down there, and then Sean Livingston blows out his knee. 
Mm-hmm. So now they got to take a point guard instead. So I was like, oh, my goodness. So I ended up staying there in the whole year. Then I was like, all right, I give up on the NBA. I'm going uh, – then I signed to go to Japan. Mm-hmm. So I do that whole year in Japan, lead the league in scoring and all that. And the craziest thing, I get a call from the Cavs to come work out. I just so happen to be in the city. I'm it, was, it, was, family. it was just a random – like you hadn't been hearing anything from your agent. They just randomly hit you up. They, they hit my agent up and was like, uh, we want Jawad to come to a workout. Wow. I said, no. I was like, no. I'm like, I'm not oh, doing yeah, it. Was tired, you were tired of the politics. You was just tired yeah, of it. Yeah. I was like, no, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not doing it. They begged me to come. I go on the second call, I go. No, the third call, I finally say yes. I go to the workout, and they got me in there with no disrespect to these guys, but these guys I didn't view mm-hmm. as being on my level. So I was like, if this is the light they view me in, then I'm wasting my time. Right. Ain't no, right. there was one assistant coach in there, and they tell my agent, oh, we're recording everything. I was like, yeah, right. Like, you ain't recording no, yeah. no workouts of us just doing pin downs and two on two. Like, you ain't recording that. Like, get out of here. So I leave. Right. Now I go back in the hood. I'm on Eddie Road at this time, like just chilling. Mm-hmm. My agent called, hey, they want you to come up for mini camp. I was like, nah, man, I ain't wasting my time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They asked me, my agent said, Jawad, you gotta go. They really want you. I was like, no, they just wasted my time with this last workout. I'm not going back up there. So then the third time they called, I said, let me call you back. I called my grandmother. I said, Grandma, the cash want me to come work out for him again. What should I do? Mm-hmm. And she was like, baby, I want you to come home. So I was like, Call my agent back, like tell him I'm on my way. Now I had been kicking it in the hood all day, chilling. Yeah. yeah. I just jump in the car, drive to the workout to their mini camp, destroy their mini camp, mm-hmm. and then go to summer league and all that, blah 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 blah, and that turned into three year deal. Wow. But I had no intentions on coming back. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> that's a crazy story, and and. Sometimes things randomly like that happen, you know, when you, you know, with the NBA and just professional sports in general, you just never know, you know, when that opportunity will come. So once, once, the, once, you, once you got that three-year deal, just walk me through the, like, what was the vibration? Like, I remember, uh, what, 2009, I think the Cavs had, like, the best record in the, in the NBA. We was cooking. Every, we, we all thought we all thought we was to the finals. We was going to get our first chip. I think that's when Brown, Brown was still pretty young, 25, 26, but he was, like, becoming one of the best in the NBA. So just just walk me through some of, some of, some of those experiences. Well, I, my first my, – my years wasn't – all those three years, they wasn't guaranteed. So I had to make the team every year, but it was kind of yeah. like – it was a shoe-in. I just had to handle my part. So, right, right. But when I get there, like like you said, I've known Brian for so long. Mm-hmm. So when I'm, I'm seeing him there, I see how everybody else is viewing him. Mm-hmm. And that, that was more amazing than the person that he had become and the player that he has become because I see how everybody is like, yo, that's LeBron. I'm like, him? Dude from Africa? <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, Do you have annoyances since, like, 98? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I, just, I just didn't view him in the same light as everybody did, but, you know, I knew him. So yeah. we kind of had a rapport. And then, like, um, during workouts and things like that, he used to, like, he was a big influence on – probably me making a team because he used to cheer for me. Like, yeah, he'd be sitting on the sideline like, yeah, why cook him? They don't know who you are, blah, blah, blah. And I, like, yeah, and I would yeah. just go at people. Like, mm-hmm, he cheering mm-hmm. me on the whole time. Yeah. So season start, I really don't play a lot. Like they, like you said, that first year, we went 62 games. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that year, uh, who do we have? It was Brian, Ben Wallace, Big Z, mm-hmm. Mo, Booby. We had a, we had a good squad. Right. But then that second year, we got we got better. Like we got Shaq, Antoine yep. Jameson, yeah, I remember Mario that. Moon. Yeah. Like we had a squad. I'm like, oh, are we rolling? Mm-hmm. And I get my big break. Everybody gets hurt. Uh yeah. I think Delante, Delante got hurt. Jamario got hurt. I think Booby uh, got hurt too, because that's when you got your first start. Yeah. And then yeah. the crazy thing, the first time I sub in the game, I'm Kind of like I'm watching the game, but I'm daydreaming. And Mike, Mike Brown keep calling my name. He's like, wow, let's go. So I'm like, he ain't talking to me. Like, wow, let's go. So I yeah. sub in. And I, I, I remember because I was like, I had 10 points, five rebounds, five assists. Yeah. And the biggest thing about that night was my first NBA bucket. No, my, that was the year before. But that night when I finally got to play, he kind of like, we're going on a West Coast trip. I need you to be ready. I was like, all right, cool. 
And then I run into everybody on that trip. I run into Mello, Brandon Roy. All the, all the ballers. Uh, yeah, Kobe. Like, I got to guard all these dudes. And we, we played D-Wade before we went out there. And I, I was holding my own. I was averaging like 13 and five and four assists. Like, and, this, and, and you have been doing that. Fun. You did that in college. Like, that's, that's what you do. Yeah. <laughs> Just being who I am. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, Mike yeah. Brown was like, shoot threes and ISO people. That's what mm-hmm. we want from you. All right, cool. And this is this is before the stretch four era of basketball where everybody's just shooting threes now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you know that that run right there was great. But the best part about it was my teammates, man. We had a great crew. Like everybody yeah. was cool, man. Like yeah, everybody, everybody seemed so all, together. That togetherness. Yeah. yeah. And all my boys from other teams used to be like, "Yo, would you, whatever you living in Cleveland ain't real life in the NBA, so don't get used to it." All right, they used to always tell me that. They were yeah. like, yo, because once you get, like, all them dudes got money, and this the hats off to Brian. Brian was the man, but he kept everybody together. Like, yeah. nobody, nobody, like, went off on their own. Brian mm-hmm. kept everybody together. We, we went out to eat together. We partied together, everything. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was, that was the culture he created. And and that's so and that that that's why it's so crazy because even as, as young as he was, he was probably what, like twenty five. He was doing that, and now he's still doing that thing, like keeping keeping teams together, keeping guys together. Guys always talk about that. I gotta ask you this, man. God bless, God bless the dead. God bless that legend. You know, I still can't believe it. You know what happened to Kobe, man? Did any you you guard Kobe Bryant, man? Did anything stand out? Obviously, we know Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James. Whatever your ranking is, I guess it just depends on your era. <laughs> like, did any, did, did any moment stand out guarding him, man? Because I know he modeled his game so much, uh, you know, off of Michael Jordan. No, before guarding him, though, I got to tell you this story. I'm walking out on the court. I'm getting ready to work out him and Brian talking. And I'm walking out. He walk up to me like, yo, what's up, why? I'm like, first of all, I'm like, oh, Kobe know me. Kobe. <laughs> and he's like, he like, congratulations. He's like, congratulations, man, you made it. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, that's what's up. Yeah. I go work out. I'm like, yo, Kobe know me. Yeah. So then we, <laughs> I'm guarding them. We playing. Uh, this is my second year. I'm guarding them. I sub in the game. And you ever seen that 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 video where Brian talk about Kobe blowing his and blow, doing like this? Yeah, yeah. I sub in the game and I see Kobe turn around. He looked at me. He was like, "Hey, hey." I mean, he about to go ISO, break off the triangle. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, oh, he ain't gonna do me like that. So I yeah, press yeah. all up on him. Yeah, yeah. Dabs at me, gave me a J. I'm like, oh. Yeah, here you go. So then go. next possession we come down. I'm super aggressive now. I'm pushing him. I'm almost fouling him. Yeah. He hit yeah. me with the fadeaway. Oh. Hit me again. I'm like, man, I can't go out like this. So then I got a little <laughs> back cut laid up. By the time I laid it up, my sub was already at the table. <laughs> like that dude was so skilled, man. Wasn't nothing you yeah. could do about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His his, his skill level was just immaculate. But 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 seeing it, but seeing it face up and trying to guard him. Like, I know that was, like, just like a – it, it probably seemed so effortless. Yeah, I wanted to prove something. So, I'm trying to be super aggressive, and it just didn't matter. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it didn't matter. Yeah. Like, he, was, he was just that talented, dude. Right, 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 right. So, um, other than that moment, did any other moments stand out to you in 2009? I know, you know, everybody expected the Cavs to at least get to the finals. At what, because, you know, and guys still talk about this. I see analysts talk about it all the time that – Everyone thought that year it would be the Cavs and the Lakers in the finals, and Brown would finally be able to go against Kobe in the finals. But, uh, you know, you all couldn't get past Orlando, uh, you know, when they had Dwight Howard and those guys. So, like, uh, did any other moments stand out to you during that season? Uh, not really, man. You know, the problem was we lost to Orlando my first year, and then the second year we lost to Boston. Okay. But the reason we lost to Boston is because we built a team – to beat Orlando and Orlando gets knocked out by Boston and then Boston, right. we catch Boston and we ain't got the personnel for them. And that, yeah. And, uh, what, 2010, that Boston team was, was Paul Pierce and KG and, uh, Ray Allen, right? Yep. We didn't have the personnel for that. We had, we had got big. Yeah. Had, that's why we got Shaq. So Shaq, we can yeah. neutralize Dwight Howard, but then we didn't face them. So now we yeah. just, we out there yeah. and they running all over the place and they were playing a little smaller lineup and that yeah. just took us out of everything, man. Well, yeah, what what was it like playing against the first big three, you know, with, with Ray Allen and KG? I mean, I, I, and everyone knows, you know, KG is a legend. Uh, I, like, obviously, I watch all the Players' Tribune, the Knuckleheads, and uh, all the smoke. I watch all the basketball 
uh, podcast because, you know, basketball was always my second love. I used to always play, so I, I still like being in it. But they always said, like, KG, like, talked the most trash. Like, was he the biggest oh, yeah. trash talker you ever saw? <laughs> yeah, like, I think it was a preseason game when I first had my encounter with him. Mm-hmm. Like, we on the free throw line, and I got my hand on him. He knocked my hand down. <laughs> put my hand on him again. He knocked my hand down again. He, like, trying to, like, hurt, like, hurt my wrist. Yeah. So the third day, I was like, yo, big fella, you hit my arm again. It's going to be a misunderstanding in here. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, he kind of, like, chilled out a little bit. Because at that point, you know, I'm, I'm a guy trying to make the team, but I ain't never been a sucker. Like, of like, course. Home, like, this, that's kind of what helped me get on the Cavs roster because I wasn't backing down from nobody. Yeah, yeah, that, just that, that Cleveland inner city dog mentality. Like, yeah, we, we always going to compete. Like, there were times I used to call, I used to tell my wife, well, she, you know, I'd tell my wife, like, hey, they might send me home today because – you know, I almost got into a fight with so and so. Yeah, yeah. She's like, and I used to be like, I didn't care because that that was that's what that was my thing. Like, right. I just never been a sucker, so you wasn't gonna treat me like that. But that big three team was tough, man. Like, Ray Allen and he coming off pin downs and all that. Ray stuff Allen was like that. deadly, deadly from the. Man. And then I used to be so fascinated with him because he always had the freshest Jays on. Always, <laughs> the exclusive Jays that nobody else had. Yeah, I used to, I, one game I asked him, like, "Yo, let me get them off you." He's like, "No, nah, I only got one pair." I'm like, "Come on, man." <laughs> was it the Was it the green and white twelves? <laughs> it was the elevens. It was the gold elevens with the green sole. <laughs> oh man, yeah, that's them. Them one on one. Yeah, I tried to get them off him. He wasn't yeah. having it though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I already know, but that's man. That those are such great experiences, man. So talk about after your Cavs run. You know, I think I, I think you you know you go back overseas, and obviously, like you say, still to this day, you still playing. So let's talk about from what was that, 2011 to now. I mean, it's almost 2021, so you 10 years in playing playing overseas. A question that I wanted to ask you because you've literally been all around the world. What country stands out to you? Like, what what was the best? What was the best place you ever played, and why? As far as overseas, uh, see, that's tough, man. Like. Being over every country has something different, offers something different. Like Japan, the culture is based on uh, respect for others. So I love to hear. Um, you know, it's a real tech friendly type place. You know, yeah. you got robots everywhere and all that. And I wanted my kids to indulge in this. That's why I decided to come back to Japan. Of course. So my kids actually speak a little bit of Japanese. Wow. Um, uh, let me see, where else? Turkey. Turkey okay. was Turkey was dope. Turkey's like a place that nobody really talks about, but Istanbul, Turkey, and places like that are dope, man. Then uh, let me see where else. Israel's always fun. Mm-hmm. Paris. I lived in Paris for three years. Yeah, yeah. lived in, yeah, like living in Paris. Like I could see the Eiffel Tower from my kitchen. Like it was dope. Oh, like, man. So my <laughs> wife loved Wait, that too. Yeah, you know, waking man? up every day seeing the Eiffel Tower like in the morning. Yeah, yes. man. Then we used to. We spent a lot of time just hanging out in France because the way our schedule was, like we had plenty of free time. Yeah. But like every country offers something different, man. But I think Japan has been one of the best places for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I was the first, in, I was the first player to play in Japan and then go to the NBA. Yeah. Then I yeah. became the first player to go from Japan to the NBA and then come back to Japan. And uh, my first year back, I won two titles. Uh, my first two years, I won two titles. I would have had three, but Corona canceled last season. So yeah, yeah. What so, yeah, uh, it's been, it's been dope. Which, which, which championship would you say is most valuable? Because I, you know, I saw that, you know, you won several championships overseas, but then you also are NCAA champion, champion as well. Uh, which would you, which championship would you say holds the most value or the most weight, you know, in your eyes, or 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 do they all hold the same kind of value? No, uh, NCAA title for sure. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, with leagues, when you win a, a championship in a league, it's kind of like another team, the next year is going to win it, then another, it continues to go on. Yeah. But in college, you got four years to reach that one goal. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, I reached that goal. Like, not many guys can say they won their final college game, and I did. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? So, you know, we still had those discussions with guys. You know, it's a couple, like Ryan Kelly over here from Duke. Mm-hmm. And uh, James Michael McAdoo from Carolina on his team, so we okay. end up having those discussions that like we got something that they can't take from us. Exactly, that's and we got national championships. You can't go back and get that. Like if you lose yeah. the championship in I don't know in Spain, 
you can always sign to another team and try to win it. Yeah, there's true. no you got four years to get it accomplished in the NCAA, and that's why yeah. it holds so much weight to guys. Yeah, I man, I I can only imagine. Like like you say, you, you you're in an elite company. Uh, so yeah, just just uh, two more questions. Who get give me your top three, like may, maybe top three or top five players that you played against, and just whether it was high school, college, pro. Give me give me your top three to five guys that you had to that you had to face. That you still have in your conscious mind, I was like, man, that dude was that dude was tough to guard, or that dude was the truth. LeBron, Kobe, Melo. LeBron, Kobe, Melo, in in no particular order. <laughs> no, honestly, the hardest to guard of that bunch is probably Melo. And that's crazy. That's so crazy because, like, I feel like the narrative now is everyone keeps talking about why is it is Carmelo misunderstood? Why why, why doesn't he get the respect? you know, that he deserves? What's, 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 what's your take yes, that Because it's today's game has changed. You know, yeah. Melo was brought up in an era like a, like an MJ type era where there was a lot of isolations and all that stuff. Yeah. And Melo was 6'8", 260. He was a bully. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. He could catch it on the block. He could put you in the realm. He could dunk. Mm -hmm. He had a jab series that was crazy. He could shoot. His mid-range was he crazy, do, too. He could do everything. He could yeah. do everything. Yeah. And now the game is turning to one guy handling the ball for, you know, 18 seconds out of 24 second shot clock. Mm -hmm. And if he don't score, he passing it to another guy for three. The mm -hmm. game has changed. You know what I'm saying? That's why Melo, they all, they tried to phase Melo out, but they tried Melo to. is so valuable because he, he brings something to the table that a lot of guys lack. And that's just an all around game, an inside around. outside game. Right. Like think about it. If you think about some of the teams, how many guys do you see work that mid range area? It doesn't happen anymore. You know right, what I mean? Right, now it's either right. three or a layup. And yeah, you're right. You're right. That's why Melo doesn't get respected. I mean, yeah. and then we all know what Brown about. He just, right. if he decides he's going to go for 50, ain't nothing you can do about it. We know yeah. what Kobe about. And, you know, you, you said three, but I got to throw KD in there somewhere. Cause okay, yeah. Buddy, buddy listed at 6'9", but he every bit of seven foot. Right, they, they, yeah, they, I think they, I thought they listened at like six eleven, but I know he's seven foot. He got a seven three wingspan, but he can man, shoot. The dude, he can shoot like he's dude unreal, man. Like, <laughs> ain't nothing that you could be in his face, but he's seven feet tall. Like, yeah. what you gonna do about that? Yeah, so, yeah. Those those guys right there are tough, man. Stand out, stand out to you. Um, does it does it ever? I mean, obviously we we were, we were from Cleveland. We're Ohio boys. Does it ever bug you out that? you know, one of the top three, top four considered basketball players is literally from where we're from. Obviously not exactly Cleveland, but I mean, well, we get to Akron in 20 minutes, you know, 20, 25 yeah. minutes on the freeway. So does that ever kind of bug you out that, 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 that someone like that, or that stature is essentially from where we're from or kind of like grew up how we grew up and kind of had those same kind of ethos and ethics to, to themselves? Uh, no, nah, it don't really surprise me, man. I think what's more surprising is when I hear other people talk about him in a certain light. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Because Brian is the most down-to-earth superstar I've ever encountered. You know what I mean? Like, he he takes care of people. You know what I mean? He takes care of everybody. He makes sure everybody around him eats yeah. one way or another. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? But, like, to have somebody of that stature be from the area, it means a lot, and it shows that you know, anybody can do it. Like, mm -hmm, if you mm -hmm. put in the work, if you make the sacrifices, uh, you can be on that level too one day. Or if exactly. not, on his level, a little greater. You know what I mean? Exactly, exactly, yeah. I, 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 same way. I think, uh, <laughs> I think I always looked at it weirdly because I, obviously I have the same name and he's, he's only like four years older than me. So people always ask, like, is your parents named after LeBron James? And there's all these, all these weird questions. But I've always, I've always felt like, I had a battery in my back. Even, I mean, even to this day, I'm done playing and I'm into a lot of other things. But just being from that era, being from that area, and uh, you know, just being a hard, hard nosed, blue collar worker, I've always had a battery in my back. And anything that I've done to always put on, just because of my name and you know where I'm from. So it's cool to get your perspective on that. Um, last question, bro. What would you say is Jawah Williams' after effect right through? I mean, you, I got 20 plus years of sports experience. You probably closer to 30. Uh, what would you say is your after effect or aftershock through the wins and the losses and the injuries at St. Ed and at North Carolina, then the Cavs and just this whole journey overseas? What were some lessons, you know, that you learned that you ingratiate into your kids now and ingratiate 
you know, the kids when you go back to Cleveland and you playing in those open gyms and those shoot arounds. What what were some of those lessons that you learned that you would take with you that you know that hold the most value? Uh I think one, the biggest one might be dealing with adversity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it may like people always get the perception that being a professional athlete is just peaches and cream. You know, that's not the case. No, that's not like, the you case. You don't understand. Like there's billions of people around the world gunning for your spot, whether you mm -hmm. play in the NBA, overseas, no matter where you at, there are people who billions of people around the world literally fighting for a couple thousand jobs. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So like, it's just dealing with adversity. Like you're dealing with the, the heartbreak of getting released from a team, dealing with yeah. the heartbreak of uh, an injury or having to battle back from an injury. Like I tore my Achilles when I was 30, 34, 35 years old. Mm -hmm. I wasn't supposed to bounce back from that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like when you're that old, you don't bounce back. They, everybody right. told me you'll be out a year. Some yeah. people completely wrote me off. Like, you know, you're too old to bounce back from that. I was back yeah. on the court hooping. Like full go in seven months. Wow. From you know off, off, off so of Achilles, dealing, that's tough. Yeah, yeah. Completely ruptured my Achilles and was back seven months. So like dealing with adversity, you know, my kids, they watched me rehab through it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I came mm -hmm. home, they see me have surgery, they see me not be able to walk, they see me go to the gym and have to teach myself how to walk again during rehab, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all that type of stuff. But yeah. like it's just being able to handle adversity, man. That goes back to the upbringing in the neighborhood. You yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. Walk outside your door, you don't know what's gonna happen. You don't but know whatever what's it happen. is, you got to deal with it. You know right. what I mean? You got to deal with it. You got to you got to thug your way through, and you'll be all right. The best you, know you can. Yeah. Yeah. It, it always turns out. It always turns out to be good, man. Only exactly. time every only only time it gets bad is when you fold, and that just ain't in me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's it's crazy, man. Even like you say, even with you through your whole journey, year sixteen, uh, you know, four years at North Carolina, year sixteen playing professional basketball, all the different experiences you had, all the championships, all the wins, losses, injuries, all the, your different experiences. It's wild that even after all that, it always goes back to that core value of that, that Cleveland mentality, never giving up, you know, fall down eight times, fall, fall down seven times, get up eight. Like you say, never folding and just continuing to, to push and pound the pavement, like and, and, until you and getting where you want to get. And then when you get there, going even harder it's, it's crazy after all those years it still goes back to that yeah man i mean that like i mean you know you know what it's yeah. like when you walk when you live on st Clair. everybody yeah. in cleveland knows what it's like on st Clair. that's why yeah. they tell people don't go down there like <laughs> yeah you get the option of not going down there i live yeah. there you know what i'm saying right. so i had to deal with it firsthand account right so like all that stuff it just made me who i am you know mm -hmm. i'm, I'm mm -hmm. proud to be from cleveland uh, I'm even more proud to be from St. Clair. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? I, and I wear that, I, I wear that with pride. You know what I mean? And make sure everybody knows it. Mm -hmm. And I don't care who has a problem with it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, you know, it, it is what it is. I know what type of players. I know what type of people are bred in tough situations. And I, mm -hmm. and I have a mm -hmm. big respect for anybody that's doing anything, mm -hmm. whether it be sports, business, or anything that's coming from my neighborhood. If I mm -hmm. can ever help and lift them up, I do so. Yeah, that, definitely, definitely, man. Well, that's a, that's actually all I had, man. Uh, I appreciate you carving out the time. Like we talked about earlier, 2020 has been a super, super weird year. So I've been trying to pride myself on giving guys flowers while, they, while they're still here. This is kind of a, a moment that I never thought would happen. But I just want to tell you face up, man, that I'm obviously super proud, super, super lucky to even know you have some, some kind of relationship, but super proud of all the accomplishments, all the accolades, man. Keep going, keep putting on for Cleveland. Like me seeing you at such a young age, put a battery in my back to to get to the level of you know playing in the Big Ten and doing different things, all the different things that I've done. So it's it's a full circle moment for me to be able to tell you that man to man face to face because I <laughs> I never you could have told me five years ago that I would start a podcast and start telling these stories, but the passion just came, the passion for storytelling just kind of came out of nowhere, and I just been kind of just living and walking in it. But I wanted to tell you that face to face man to man because we don't know what will happen. You know this, this year has been weird, so. I hope you can I see appreciate it, man. Yeah. I appreciate it. And I, I shot you a message before I told you. I appreciate what you're doing by providing this platform. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You know, certain guys need their story told, man. Exactly, and, exactly. And you never know who's watching. Like, you know, so I appreciate that, man. It means a lot. And uh, keep going. If I can ever be of any assistance, just hit me up and let me know, though. Okay, yeah, appreciate it. And uh, once I get once you started I, on your book, we gotta get you I, on your book, I was just about to say that, man. When I, uh, I already, I've already written a few rough drafts, but I'm still trying to 
figure out what kind of su- superpowers I could give me or my sister because I already got like the bad stuff done because you know we know about that. So I was able to write that down quick. Uh, but I'm still thinking, I'm still crafting it, but I'm, I'll definitely reach out to you once I'm done and try to get like a publisher or someone to proofread it first and then the illustrations and all that. So I appreciate, I appreciate that game. Oh yeah. Right now. Yeah. Self publish. Self publish. So you own everything. Yeah. Yeah, Okay. Ownership is key though. I'm going to tell you that. And you know, I learned that through Nipsey. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. To, I listen to Nipsey Hussle. Me too. Man. I listen to him every day, man, trying to catch that ownership game. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing. Imagine signing. I, quick story. I had a um, publishing deal. I turned down. Okay. Like, people, I had a deal and I just didn't like it. Because, like, yeah. once you sign that publishing deal, they, they own the rights to your book. They can change I, the characters and everything. I was about to say, yeah, because I haven't done any research on that. I was about to say, do they own a percentage or they own it outright, 100%? They own they own it. And then wow. whatever they sell, they give you a kickback off your work. Wow. Nah, I need all mine. My kids yeah. need mine. Of like, course. My kids need theirs. That's how, about say, how about to say, yeah, they need theirs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's them. That's their money. That's this their story. So okay. Yeah, ain't nobody. Yeah, ownership, dog. Yeah, we'll talk about it. Now, oh yeah. I feel you in all the blanks. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We we'll talk about it. Hey, I appreciate you calling out the time, man. We'll definitely be in touch. Yes, sir. Appreciate all you, right. man. Thanks. All right, man. Got to uh, just take a couple deep breaths. You are stay. Uh, <laughs> give me a couple seconds. You know, um, you know, six months ago when I started this this podcast, never in my dreams would I have thought that I would be able to get Jawad on. I know he's still active he's playing still, you know, it was, it's midnight there now in Japan, but 16, prof- 16 year veteran, played with the cast for three years. Uh, obviously, if you've listened to the whole conversation, you know, played against the Kobe Bryant and obviously was teammates with LeBron James and played against the, the young, the, the young Melo and KD and just all these different experiences, literally from Cleveland, Ohio, um, I hope you, I really, really, truly hope you all, you all have listened to the entire episode. This was a super, super powerful episode. And again, just, it was so cool to get an inside look on Jawad's story, right? The whole ethos of me starting this podcast was to tell our stories for viewers and listeners and fans to get an inside look on why we are as athletes or former athletes, the way that we are. And this episode was no different. So again, the Patreon account is coming, the t-shirts and t-shirts and i'll have like a few stickers and coffee mugs and things of that nature some after effect podcast merch is coming it's in production just be patient with us as we close here and uh yeah we'll continue to tell these stories so until episode 37 peace